Okay, so for the last lecture, we spent the majority of the time talking about the uh, maximum principle for the diffusion equation. And so what I want to do to begin the lecture is just quickly review uh, what the maximum principle is and talk about uh, one pretty important application of the maximum principle. Uh, and so then we're going to, after a little bit of, of related discussion, we're going to move on and actually start talking about how to solve the diffusion equation. Uh, because remember, at this point, we're only, we've only discussed some very important but also kind of abstract properties of solutions to the diffusion equation without discussing how you can actually find a, a solution. So that will be the, the second part of the lecture, which will take actually quite a long time. So it's going to move on, to move into the, the second lecture for this week as well. Like, I don't think we're going to be able to finish it today. Uh, okay, and so remember, what is what is the maximum principle for the diffusion equation? Uh, well, let's suppose you have a function which solves the, the diffusion equation, right? So remember that means that ut minus some constant k times uxx is equal to zero. And suppose that this is in a uh, space-time rectangle. Say x is between zero and some number l. And t is between zero and some capital T, right? And so if you draw this, well, as we did before, let me draw the left and right and lower boundaries with red and then put the top like this. So this is like say the x-axis or the t-axis and this is the, the x-axis. And so this is the region, right? So inside this rectangle, this is the region, region R. And so the maximum principle says that uh, the max is attained or the maximum value of your solution is attained on one of the red lines. Right, so if you think about this in terms of the heat equation, this is saying like the, the hottest point or one of the points on the boundary is always the, the hottest point. I mean, there could be potentially be other points where it's equally hot, but at least one, one of the points on the boundary will have the hottest temperature. Uh, Uh, sorry, so one of the red boundary lines. Okay, and so what are the, well, what are the equations of these lines, right? The, they're just the boundary points. So this is when x is equal to L, x is equal to zero, or little t, time is equal to zero, right? And so one way to think of this is, remember, we had this metal pipe, and the pipe was being or metal rod, sorry, and the uh, the heat source was at one end of the, the metal rod. And so as time evolves, heat moves from left to right throughout the, the rod and the rod heats up. But at, at every point in time, since the heat source is on the left, that's the hottest point, which is a boundary point. And then on the right hand side, well, this is the coolest point because it's the furthest away from the heat source, right? So this is a, a good picture to have in mind when you're thinking about the, the maximum principle. Uh, you may be a little bit confused in this example, like what about where does the line t equals zero come from in the, in the picture? Well, maybe think about an alternative scenario where you're, you're still heating up a metal, uh, a metal rod, but maybe initially, like when time t is equal to zero, there's no heat source, right? Maybe you turn the oven on, think of it like an oven, you turn it on and it takes a little bit of time for the heating to start up. Well, at every future point, the temperature is only going to increase, right? So that means that the, the smallest or the minimum uh, temperature will be at the uh, at the boundary point, right? And so, well, if you remember, there's a correspondence between the maximum and the minimum principle that involves just taking the negative of, of the solution. And so this is one scenario where, in this case, I guess, rather than the, the maximum, the, the minimum value would occur when, when t is equal to zero, right? So I should also, I guess, at this point, remind us that there's also a minimum principle which says the, the same thing except you just replace uh, maximum by minimum. Okay, and so what we're gonna do now is look at an application of this maximum principle, which turns out to be very, very important to, the, to studying the, the initial value problem in this, these sorts of domains, right? So let's look at a particular type of initial value problem. Uh, 
Right, and so we're, we're going to consider the, the same domain as above. Right, so it's going to be some sp uh, like finite space time rectangle where x is in a certain interval and, and time is in a certain interval. And so, uh, right, so what does the initial value problem look like? Well, you want to solve the PDE. Uh, wait, let's look at the most general uh, non homogeneous version. I mean, f could be zero, but. Uh, but for now, let's actually just look at the more general version where f is just some function that doesn't depend on you, uh, right? And we want 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to l, 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to capital T. And then we want this subject to, to certain boundary conditions. And so the boundary conditions will just be conditions on each of the, the lines that were specified before, right? So we want, say, when time is equal to zero, u is equal to some function phi of x. This is like the, if you think about this in terms of heat, this is like the initial heat of the, the metal rod, which is between x equals zero and x equals L. Um, right, and then we also have, well, what about the, the left and right endpoints, right? So this is when, when x is equal to zero and when x is equal to L. Well, notice that as time evolves, this could change depending on t. So we want some function of t for these these things. So let's call the when x equal to, is equal to zero. Let's say that the solution looks like a function g of t. You can think of g as describing like the heat source on the left end of the the metal rod, right? And so maybe over time you're increasing the heat, so g will change, or maybe over time you decrease the heat, so g could could change in that way as well. And then also we need the right the right endpoint, so let's call this a function h. And so you can think of this in, in the same way, right? When this is on the, the other end, right? Say this is zero and this is L. When x is equal to L, as time evolves, you could be changing the heat source possibly, and maybe this function h of t describes uh, that heat source. Uh, right, and so these are the, these are the boundary conditions. Right. And so the, the standard initial value problem for the diffusion equation in a domain like this requires you to specify um, all of these different boundary conditions in order to actually solve it. And we'll, we'll see why later on in, in the semester. Uh, one thing that you, that to point out that may be confusing uh, the first time you see this is, well, remember, this is a, a first order equation in time. although it's a second order equation overall because there are two x derivatives, but let's pretend the x derivatives aren't there for now and just think of, of the time derivatives. Well, from what you remember from studying ordinary differential equations and also uh, thinking back to what we saw with the wave equation, you would think that the number of initial conditions should reflect like the number of time derivatives, for example, right? For the wave equation, we had two time derivatives, so we require two different functions as our initial conditions. Um, but here, there's only one time derivative, so you would expect there should only be one initial condition, right? So why, why is it that we have three different functions here? Uh, well, the, I mean, the, the way to resolve this is to point out that you can think of these three functions as the same function, right? Because, well, I have, uh, in the sense that it, it, it's going to be piecewise defined, right? So I have my function phi over here on the bottom boundary line. And then when u is equal, or when x is equal to zero, I have my function g on the left boundary line. And then when x is equal to l, I have my function h on the right boundary line. But you can think of these as just one function on the whole red line, just such that it equals g on the left line, it equals phi on the bottom line, and it equals h on the top right line. And so this is a way to, to maybe match this, this picture with what you're used to thinking about when you're thinking about initial conditions. Uh, right. So let me just write this here. Can be thought of as as one piecewise defined function on the boundary on the on the red boundary line. And if this discussion just complicates things further, you can just ignore ignore everything I just said and just remember that, well, for this IVP, we have three initial conditions. 
and and don't worry about it any any further. But I did want to point this out in case there was some confusion about like the number of, of boundary conditions. Uh, it is it is the same picture as what we we've seen previously. Uh, just since the boundary is basically uh, the boundary has corner points, you have to break up the functions according to the corner points. Is is what's going on. Um, okay, and so what are we going to do now? Well, we're not going to actually figure out, we're not going to talk about how to solve this initial value problem at this point because it requires some more sophisticated techniques which we don't have available at this point in the semester, although we will come back to this problem. Uh, what we are going to do is show that there's at most one solution. So this is going to be a, another theoretical result. Uh, so this will be a theorem, which is normally referred to as the uniqueness of the problem. And so the theorem says there is at most one solution. So there could be no solution, but if there is a solution, there's only one. And so when I say at most one, I mean once you fix the function f, the function phi, the function g, and the function h, right? So there's at most one solution to the initial value problem once uh, F, V, G, and H are, are given to you. Of course, you can find different solutions by changing the boundary conditions as, as expected. Uh, the point is that once the boundary conditions are specified, there can only be one solution to the problem. Uh, OK, and so I mean, the first time you see uniqueness results like this, which are very common and very important in the study of partial differential equations, you may think to yourself, OK, that's a nice theoretical result, but it doesn't tell me how to solve the problem, so maybe this isn't so useful. Uh, so that's actually not the case, because remember, the reason we're, we're studying these equations, I mean, mathematically, they're independently interesting, but, but for applications to physics and engineering, partial differential equations are very important. And for these applications, it's very important to know that if you write down a solution, it actually describes in a good way the, the physical system. Right. So if there are, if it's possible that there are like a hundred different solutions that, or a hundred different different functions that will give you solutions, and the, the functions behave differently or something like that, then you have no guarantee that the solution you're writing down is going to give you an accurate description of the physical picture, because since the unique, if the uniqueness breaks down, the functions could sort of change in, in complicated ways. Right, so the uniqueness helps guarantee that there's some kind of physical relevance here, right? Because I mean, when you when you think about like the the uh, the, the, the physical angle, if you take a, a metal rod and you heat it at one point, right? So the basic like deterministic principles of physics would tell you that you expect the heat flow to be the same every time, right? And so this is just what the uniqueness statement is, right? We're proving mathematically that once you know what the boundary conditions are, uh, that the it, it can only behave in one in one way. So that's what the uniqueness says. So so it is important for applications outside of math to have like a decent understanding of, of uniqueness. And so let me write this as just like a little note. Uh, well, uniqueness results, you can think of this as like de deterministic. Uh, right, so physics, determinism in physics, right? It's important that that your system has like, follows the same rules every time once you uh, once you fix the boundary conditions, right? Okay. okay, and so we're going to prove this using the maximum principle, actually. Uh, right, and so let's let's move into the, the proof. And so this is a, a very common argument in the study of, of partial differential equations. And so the idea is, well, let's suppose, what does it mean for the, uh, for the IVP to have a unique solution? It means that if there are two solutions, then they have to be the same function, right? So suppose, say, u1 of xt and u2 of xt are two functions which are solutions to the same initial value problem. Right, 
And so what does this mean? This means, okay, well, if I look at the, uh, the differential operator associated to the, the diffusion equation, uh, and I apply this to each of the, the U's, that this is gonna give me F, right? So here I is equal to one or two. And it also means that I have the same boundary conditions, right? So if I look at UI at um, when X is equal to zero, well, this should be G when X is equal to L, T is arbitrary, this should be my function H of T. And when uh, T is equal to zero, this should be phi of T. Uh, or phi of x, sorry, right? And so this is again for i equals one or two, right? So this is what it means for to have, to have two functions that solve the IVP, right? So these are the same boundary conditions. And so what does it mean again, what does it mean for the solution to be unique? Well, this is the same thing as saying that, that these two functions have to agree. Right, so I mean, what does it mean to have a unique solution? It means that if I mathematically, right, of course, yeah, I, know, I know that you know intuitively what it means for there to be only one solution, but how do you actually prove that there's a unique solution? Well, you suppose you have two solutions, as we did before to the initial value problem, and then you wanna, you wanna prove that they have to be equal. And this is how you prove a uniqueness statement. Uh, right, and so, well, what does it mean that two functions are equal? Well, in particular, if I take their difference, I always have to get zero. Right, and so what we're gonna do is now use this fact to, along with the maximum principle, to, to prove that they have to be zero, uh, right. Okay, and so the first thing to look at, we're thinking about the maximum principle. The maximum principle is related to, to boundary conditions. And we have a function here that we wanna show this is equal to zero, right? And so what we wanna do first is look at uh, look at boundary conditions. And also see what, what PDE uh, it solves, right? And, right, so let me just put this as the diffusion equation uh, operator. Actually, let me just put PDE for short so this is not too confusing. Right. And so what do I mean by this? Well, let's, let's look at the boundary behavior of the difference of these two functions. So what I'm gonna do just to simplify the no notation is I'm gonna define uh, W of XT as the difference of U1 and U2. Right, and so let's see how, how W behaves on the boundary of, of this rectangle. So let's first look at the case when, when T is equal to zero. Well, if I plug in t is equal to zero here, well, this is u1 of x comma zero minus u2 of x comma zero. When t is equal to zero, I know that u1 and u2 are both equal to phi of x, right? But phi of x minus phi of x is just, this, this is the same function, so these are, that's zero, right? So this tells me that W of X zero is equal to zero. Right? And now let's look at some of the other boundary conditions. So let's say now when, when X is equal to zero, uh, right, T could be arbitrary. Well, this is now U one when X is equal to zero, T is arbitrary minus U two when X is equal to zero and T is arbitrary. Uh, but we know how both of these functions act uh, on this line. So, well, when X is equal to zero, both of these functions are equal to G. So I get G of T minus G of T, which is zero again. And finally, if we look at the points where on the other line where X is equal to L, well, we're gonna get zero again for the same reason, right? Because if I plug in X equals L to W, I get U1 of L comma T minus U2 of L comma T. And now, well, both of these functions were equal to H on the boundary, right? So I get zero as well. 
And so the conclusion here is that that W of X T is equal to zero on the on the red boundary lines, which are relevant for the maximum principle. Right? And so if W is a solution to the diffusion equation, which we haven't checked yet, but if W solves the equation, this means that the maximum value has to be zero, right? Because it, the maximum value has to occur on one of these lines. So that would imply that W has to be zero, right? Or at least it would imply that W is negative, uh, but also the minimum value would have to be zero as well. And so we'll, we'll, we'll write this argument out, argument out in detail. Uh, but in order to apply the maximum principle, we want to actually first check that, that W solves the diffusion equation, uh, which is easy in this case because this equation is linear, right? Right, so what happens if I take, if I apply this diffusion equation operator to W? Well, this is diffusion operator applied to U1 minus U2. This is linear, right? So I can write this as um, dt minus k times dxx of u1, and then minus dt minus k times uh, second partial for x, uh, all applied to u2. Uh, but by hypothesis, u1 and u2 are both solutions to the diffusion equation. Uh, we're looking at the more general picture where it's non-homogeneous, but it's with the same function, right? So we have this function f of xt. And so the left part is equal to f of xt. The right term is minus f of xt uh, because of the negative sign. And so of course, f, whatever this function f is, it doesn't matter. When I subtract it from itself, I have to get zero. Right? So this is equal to zero. And so this tells us that w, which is the difference of the two functions, is a solution to the, the homogeneous diffusion equation. And so now we're almost done, right? So, it, it, so we, we know more than just that it solves the homogeneous diffusion equation because we have all this boundary data, right? So we know that W is equal to, identically equal to zero on the red boundary lines from maximum principle. Right. Okay, so now let's put everything together, uh, right? So by the maximum principle and also the minimum principle, Well, I know that the max of x of nt of w occurs on the red boundary lines. But well, notice that my function w is equal to zero on, on these lines. So this means that the maximum value is of zero is w, or excuse me, this means that the maximum value of w is zero in the whole region. Uh, right, and so we're not quite done because W could be negative, right? I could, in theory, have a solution which is just negative for all time and for all points, uh, X. Uh, but remember, we also have the, the minimum principle, which is basically the same statement, except you change max to min. And so the minimum principle also tells you that the, the minimum occurs on the boundary points. or on the red boundary lines, right? And so this is going to imply now that the minimum of W of XT is equal to zero in the, in the whole region. Uh, and so what does this mean for the function? Well, W of XT is always less than or equal to the max of W, which we just showed is equal to zero. And W of XT, no matter what the point is, is always bigger than the minimum of W, which we just showed is equal to zero. And so the conclusion is that, well, zero is less than or equal to W of XT, which is less than or equal to zero for all points in the region or in the domain. And so as a consequence, finally, we see that, well, this means W has to equal zero.
I mean, if you have a number that's between zero and zero, it has to be zero. Right, but that's that's the end of the proof, right? Because that's what we wanted to show. Because what was W, let's just go back up here. Uh, w was just the difference between U1 and U2. And so if this difference is zero, that means U1 has to equal U2, which means there can only be one function that solves this initial value problem, right? So we've proved the uniqueness. Okay, right, and so notice then that the two key ingredients were defining this function W, which is really exploiting the linearity of the diffusion equation operator, right? We're using the fact that this is a linear equation uh, very crucially. And then also using the, the maximum principle, right? Which basically shows that if you have uh, zero boundary data, like if your function is zero along all these red lines and also solves the diffusion equation, then the function has to be zero, which is essentially what we showed if you go through the argument again. And so using this fact, we, we concluded the, the uniqueness. Right. So maybe it's worth pointing that out as a note. So this argument shows that Uh, right, so let's suppose W solves the homogeneous diffusion equation, WT minus K times WXX equals zero. And also that W is identically equal to zero on the red boundary lines. Then W has to equal zero, right, for all points. And so, if you just ignore the math for a minute and remember that physically you can think of this as describing like heat flow on a metal plate, for example, or a metal, sorry, a metal rod, for example. Well, this makes perfect sense because what does it mean that, that W is zero on the boundary lines? It means there's no heat source, right? And so if there's nothing going on and the function is zero initially, right? The temperature is zero initially, it's gonna stay zero for all time, right? If there's no physical interaction, right? So that's all this says. But to, I mean, to prove this rigorously, you have to use some some somewhat somewhat fancy mathematical tools, uh, right? And, and of course, I, I'm going to keep writing red boundary lines for to keep my the the notation simple. When I when I say red boundary lines, it means like the three boundary lines from from the maximum principle, right? Okay, and so the next thing I'm gonna do is give an alternative proof of this uniqueness fact using uh, a different method, which is related to the energy. And so this should recall uh, some of these results related to the energy of the wave equation that we talked about last week. So this is called the energy method. Right, and so here's the, the scenario that we were in before. We had a function W, which was U1 minus U2. U1 and U2 were two, two solutions to the IVP with the same boundary conditions. Right. And so the goal was, uh, well, we, we also knew that, that if I take uh, WT minus K times WXX, that this solves the homogeneous equation, right? And so the goal was to show that, uh, show that W is equal to zero, right? And so we had this fancy maximum principle argument which did this. Uh, so that's not the only way to show that a function is equal to zero, of course, right? There are many ways mathematically to show that something is zero. And so for the study of partial differential equations, it turns out that there's an integral formulation of this argument, which is turns out to be very useful, uh, right? So what's one way to show that W is zero? 
Well, it would be enough to show that if I take the integral of, say, the absolute value of w, maybe with respect to x from 0 to l, that this is equal to 0 for all, for all time. Right? Well, this is just the vanishing theorem, right? Or a version of the vanishing theorem in, in one, one variable, which says that if you take the integral of something that's always bigger than or equal to 0, and the integral is 0, then the function has to be, the integrand has to be 0, right? Uh, right, because this impl implies that w is 0. Right, and, and this is really just, remember, inter when you think about integrals, you want to think about adding infinitesimal quantities. Well, if you add a bunch of things that are always bigger than or equal to 0, and they sum up to 0, the only way for that to happen is if you're adding just 0 at every point, right? So that's, what, that's the, the intuitive idea here. Uh, and so it, it turns out, since absolute values are, are sometimes hard to work with because of the fact that they're non-smooth or they have corner points, it's, it's often more convenient to work not with the absolute value, but with the square, right? So also enough to show that if I take integral from 0 to L of W squared dx, that this is 0, right? Because this is still positive. Uh, Right, using the same using the same vanishing theorem. Right, so this also implies well, it implies that w squared is equal to zero, which then implies that w is equal to zero. Right, and again for all for all t. Right, and so again, just as a matter of convenience, because it works better with the the equation, the partial differential equation, we're going to show the the second thing. Uh, right, and so let's proceed. Uh, with that argument in, in more detail. And so notice that if we, well, if we apply this argument to the function w from above, well, if w is equal to zero, that implies that the, the two candidates for solutions to our IVP would have had to be the same function, which is an, which would give another, another proof of uniqueness, right? And so if you think back for a second to the wave equation, uh, remember when we discussed the energy associated to a solution, well, there were a few integrals in the energy formula that involved squares of quantities Right, and so this integral with, with the, the square of the solution is related to the energy of, of solutions to the diffusion equation, which is why this is called the, the energy method. Uh, right. Okay, and so what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at the integral from zero to L of my function W of xt, which solves the, the homogeneous diffusion equation, diffusion equation uh, integrating with respect to x. Uh, and we also know that W is equal to zero on, on the red boundary lines, right? We have these boundary conditions. Why am I integrating from zero to L? Just because that's the full range for X, right? Remember that, I guess just to have the picture for this argument, just so that everyone can be on the same page. Right? So this is when, when X is equal to zero, X is equal to L, uh, right? And so that's the time direction and that's the X direction. And so we're assuming that W is zero on these three lines. Okay, and so how are we going to, to show that this integral is zero? Well, we're gonna, we wanna use the fact that it's a solution to the diffusion equation, right? Because if it's just like an arbitrary function, of course, this integral does not have to be equal to zero. Well, what's, what's a crucial property of, of the diffusion equation? Well, it involves a derivative with respect to time. And so what we're gonna do is differentiate this integral with respect to t and see what, see what happens basically. Uh, if it's equal to zero, of course, the derivative should be should be zero, but that's not going to follow directly. We have to we have to check. Uh, we'll we'll need to do a, a little bit of an argument. Uh, and so, since I'm differentiating with respect 
to time, well, if I use the chain rule, there's going to be a power of two that comes down when I use the power rule. So in order to just cancel that out, I'm just going to put a one half in front of the integral and I'm going to look at the derivative of that. I'm going to look at derivative of one half times the integral from above. Right. And so this is, again, one of the reasons why I made you suffer through some of these problems the first week involving differentiating integrals, because this is a, a common trick in, in studying PDEs. And so this is the same thing now as integrating the derivative of w squared with respect to x. And so now if I use the power rule for the time derivative, the two will come down and cancel. And so now I have, uh, well, I have wt times w dx, right? And so, well, now we're going to use the fact that this is a solution to the diffusion equation because, well, remember, wt is equal to negative k times wxx. So if I plug this in, what do I get? Well, I get this is now the integral from 0 to L of uh, negative k times wxx times w, right? all evaluated at the point xt and integrating x from 0 to L. Uh, and we'll notice I have, well, I have two x derivatives on the first function and no x derivatives on the second. Well, if I were to integrate by parts, um, well, I would be able to move one of the derivatives over. But if I change this integrating by parts to wx times wx, well, I'm going to be having something squared, which is going to turn out to be, to be helpful. Uh, Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm 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 off by a by a negative sign. That is why I just paused for a second. Right. So it's W T minus K times W X X is equal to zero. So this should just be positive, right? Right. And so if I well if I integrate by parts, I'm going to be able to move one of these derivatives over, and then I'm just going to have something squared, which is positive, and positive things are easier to work with. So let's let's integrate by parts. Again, if you think back to the the advice I gave when we were looking at the energy method for the wave equation. When you're analyzing partial differential equations and you don't know how to proceed, you should always try to integrate by parts and see what, what you get. Uh, so if I integrate by parts, well, this is equal to then, well, this is like my, uh, this is like my dv and this is like my u, right? Right, the dv is the thing with the derivative on it, and I'm moving the derivative over from v to u up to, and you can do this up to some boundary terms. And so in this case, the boundary terms are, well, I have k times uh, uv, which is wx uh, times w, evaluated from x equals zero to x equals l. And then I have minus the integral from zero to l of v times du, which in this case is wx times wx uh, dx. Okay. And so, well, how are we going to deal with these boundary terms first? Well, we're just going to use the fact that the function is equal to 0 on, on the boundary points, so the boundary terms are going to vanish. Right? And so if I look at well, what does this mean? This means I look at k times w uh, x of whatever this is times w of lt and then minus k times w x uh, times w of 0 t. Right, this is the, what the definition of, of the, this boundary notation is. Well, both of these are 0, right, because by the hypothesis about the boundary values of w, this is the line when x is equal to l, which is the right vertical line. And then this is the line where x is equal to 0, which is the left vertical line. So both of these things are 0. And so this is just all 0. So I can cancel that out. Uh, and well, what is this? The second integral, well, I have wx squared. And then I have negative k times that. Uh, 
And so in summary, what have we actually got? So, well, we took the time derivative of the, the initial integral times one half, where the initial integral was w squared. And we just showed that this is equal to negative k times the integral from zero to L of uh, wx uh, squared. Okay, well, what happens if you square something? If you square something, it's always positive. But we're, we're assuming, remember, that k is always bigger than zero for the diffusion equation. And so this is always strictly negative. And so if I multiply a number that's strictly negative by something that's bigger than or equal to zero, this shows that now, well, that's, that's always uh, less than or equal to zero, right? And so this shows that if I take the derivative with respect to time, of the integral on the left, that this is always negative, less than or equal to zero, which means that it's decreasing with respect to time. Right? And so the conclusion then is that uh, this implies that if I look at one half times integral zero to w, integral from zero to L of wxt squared, well, this is a function of t, notice, right? If I change t, I get a different value for the integral. Uh, so this is a decreasing function of t. Right? And so in particular, well, that means that if I lower the value of t, I'm, I'm always going to lower the value of the integral. And so let me lower t to 0. Right, so this is always less than or equal to integral one half times integral from zero to L of W of X comma zero squared. Uh, but now we're at the, the final boundary line where T is equal to zero, right? And well, if T is equal to zero, remember that, that W is equal to zero here, right? And well, if I'm integrating the function that's zero everywhere, I just get zero. Right, so this is all zero. And so the final conclusion is, well, this implies that the integral from zero to L of W squared dx is less than or equal to zero. Well, if I'm integrating something squared, that's always bigger than or equal to zero, right? And so now we have this sort of squeeze theorem scenario where the, well, this implies now that the integral of W squared is equal to zero. And that's what we wanted to show. So this implies that, that w of xt is 0 uh, for all xt. Right, so that's, that's the second proof uh, of the uniqueness result, which we framed in this way here uh, by writing w as the difference of the two functions uh, using, the, using the energy method. But we gave a, an alternative proof of this, this result. Okay, and so I do want to add a, a few more comments related to this argument. And so it turns out that this actually, uh, this, this argument, uh, which involved showing that this integral was decreasing, gives us a little bit more information about the, the initial value problem. Uh, and so we're just going to talk very briefly about something called stability, which is Another one of these things, which when you first learn about it, it seems like kind of mathematically technical and abstract, uh, but it turns out to have sort of relevant implications for the, the, the physical interpretation of the equation, uh, right? And so, well, let's, let's look at what, what we showed here. Well, let's recall that uh, W was given as the difference of these two functions where uh, U1 and U2 solve the same IVP, solve the same initial value problem. 
which was just this boundary value problem from the beginning of, of the lecture, right? There are two solutions to the same IVP. Okay, and so what does the argument show? Well, we just showed that, well, let me plug in, well, we should, let me plug in u1 and u2 minus u2 for w. Well, we show that if we integrate from zero to L of uh, say u1 of xt minus u2 of xt squared dx, that this is less than or equal to, well, of course we showed it was less than or equal to zero, but let's go one step back. If we go one step back, we have this w of x zero squared. Well, what is w of x zero? That's just the initial values of these things, right? When t is equal to zero, right? Because on the integral on the right, before we concluded it was equal to zero, we just had, well, w of x when t is equal to zero. So let me plug this in here. So this is the what we got to right before we concluded that w had to be zero. Uh, and so now let's suppose let's remove the assumption about u and u one and u two solving the same IVP, right? So let's let's remove this assumption, right? And so we're going to instead assume that well when when x is equal to zero, u1 is equal to some function phi1 of x, and u2 is equal to some other function phi2 of x. So we're changing the t equals zero boundary condition to, to two different functions. Uh, but let's assume that, that the g's and the h are still the same. Uh, right, so, but the, the other boundary values still agree. Right, so we're just we're just changing the hypothesis a little bit by removing the the assumption that that the fees or that the the initial uh, distribution of the temperatures or whatever are the same. Right, when t is equal to zero. Uh, well, as long as the boundary values still agree, uh, the term that showed up when we integrated by parts is still zero. Right, for the same reasons. Right, so when you if you want to double check that, maybe you should double check that, but you'll still get zero. Uh, Right, and so everything else in this calculation still works, right? And so if we just run the same argument, we get to this point. And so then we conclude that, uh, well, if I look at integral from zero to L of u1 of xt minus u2 of xt squared, well, what is u1? Well, it's less than or equal to this integral. Uh, well, u1 when t is equal to zero is just phi1 of x. And u2 when t is equal to zero is phi2 of x squared. Right. Right. And again, it's just the, the same argument. And so this is something that's called a stability result. Uh, why is this a stability result? Well, let's look at the integral on the right. And so let's imagine that the difference between phi one and phi two is very small. Right? So physically, this means that the, the initial conditions are very close. Right? Initial condition when t is equal to zero is very close. Right? Well, if the difference between phi one and phi two are very small, then this means that the, the integral on the right is, is very small. Right? And so if the integral on the right is a very small number, that means that the integral on the left is a very small number, right? Right, and so, well, if the integral on the left is small, that means that the function you're integrating is small, 
which means that U1 and U2 are very close to one another, right? So, so U1 and U2 whatever their values are at any given points, since if I integrate the difference of the two of them squared, I get a very, and I get a very small number, well, that would mean that the integrand is probably a very small number, which means u1 and u2 should be very close to each other, right? Assuming that phi1 and phi2 are very close to one another. Uh, and so why is this called a stability result? Well, this means that let's say phi2 is just like a very tiny perturbation of phi1. Right, I just changed the initial conditions by just like a very small amount. Well, then the difference between phi one and phi two is gonna be very small, right? Because the functions are very close to each other. Uh, and well, this implies then that the solutions for all time also have to be very close to each other, right? So physically, this, this is again related to some kind of deterministic phenomenon where if I just change the initial conditions by just a very small amount, you would expect that the solution should not change that much or you would expect that the physical system doesn't change too much if you just vary the initial conditions by a very tiny amount. And so that's what this stability property is mathematically. Uh, right. And so there are a variety of different stability results for PDEs uh, depending on, on the equation. And there are also different ways of measuring closeness. So this is something called, usually called uh, mean square, like the mean square distance between the functions. So if you've taken a stats class, you may have seen the mean square difference. Uh, we're gonna talk more about this later when we start discussing chapter five in the book, which is Fourier analysis and the Fourier series. And so this notion of, of distance between functions is gonna play a, a very important role there. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, and, and one more thing that's worth pointing out is this is, again, this is kind of an abstract looking mathematical theorem about the diffusion equation, but it has practical implications, right? Because in the real world, you're not going, I mean, the equations that we're working with do not directly describe phenomenon. They're approximations of the physical phenomenon. And so you want these approximations to be stable under very small perturbations because you're never gonna get everything 100% accurate. Right, and so your PDEs better be better have a stability property, or else they're not going to actually describe what you would expect to be the phenomenon in, in the real world. Right, so so it is important also to have stability. Uh, okay, and and while we've talked about well, we've proven a, a type of stability result for the diffusion equation, and we also just proved a uniqueness result for the diffusion equation. Uh, so these two properties are related to something that are, that's called uh, well-posedness for PDEs. So I just want to get this definition in, in the lecture. Uh, so a, a PDE, any PDE, any partial differential equation, is said to be well-posed Actually, instead of, it's true for PDE, but let me uh, put initial value problem to be more precise, right? We want to take into account boundary conditions. So an initial value problem is said to be well posed if there exist unique solutions. Or so there exists a unique solution. Unique solution, solutions plural doesn't make any sense, right? Because they're contradictory. Uh, so if there exists, a unique solution. And there's also a stability property with some kind of stability property. Right. And so, well, okay, this is math. What do I mean? You should always be rigorous with your definitions. What do I mean by some kind of stability property? Well, there are different, different ways of measuring whether or not functions are close to each other, uh, right? And so depending on the context, depending on the initial value problem or the equation you're working with, you may wanna use different ways of measuring quote unquote closeness. Uh, and so this is why I'm being kind of vague here, uh, but the main, the main thing that's relevant for stability is, is measuring uh, 
basically the, the idea that if the initial conditions are close, then the solutions are close. That's what stability is, is generally speaking. <clears throat> right, so that's the, the stability. Uh, so we just proved stability for the diffusion equation, and we also proved that if there's a solution that, it, that it's unique. And so we haven't quite showed that the diffusion equation is well posed because we need to show that there actually exists a solution, right? We need to show you can actually solve it. And so this is now what we're going to begin doing is now like we've talked about some abstract properties of the equation using the PDE uh, and using some, some mathematical analysis. Uh, and so now we're gonna move on and actually look at trying to find solutions. And so this is, I guess, the content of, of section 2.4 in the book, just to keep track of where we are in following the text. Okay, and, and as I alluded to earlier uh, in, in not this lecture, but the last lecture, it's going to be a lot more difficult to find specific solutions for the diffusion equation than it was for the wave equation. And so in particular, even if your boundary conditions are relatively simple functions, it's gonna turn out that the solutions to the diffusion equation can look very complicated. Uh, and so it's gonna take us a bit of time to even actually derive the, the solution formula that will, that will explain why this is the case. Uh, but I just want to warn you in advance that it's not going to, we're not going to end up with like a nice, simple, simple formula. Uh, it's going to involve like an integral and, and things like that. Uh, great. And so, so well, what are we going to look at? Well, we're going to look at uh, a different IVP. Uh, well, the initial value problem now, well, we're going to have, well, U is a solution to the diffusion equation. Uh, well, at time zero, it's gonna have this initial state, which we're gonna describe by phi of x. Uh, but instead of looking in this rectangle, we're just gonna look at uh, points x on the whole real line. Right, so we're changing our domain from the rectangle from before to the whole real line. Uh, just because as with the wave equation, this makes it easier to solve the solve the PDE, uh, and so in a few weeks we'll still we'll talk about we'll return to uh, the problem in this rectangle, and we'll talk about how to solve the equation uh, in this rectangle. But for now, we're just going to look at the what turns out to be the easier case, which is when x is just on the the real line. Right? Um, Right, and so what I'm what I'm just going to do to end the lecture today is just begin the argument and be, and begin listing some of the the big ideas we're going to use to find a solution, and then on on Thursday's lecture we'll actually go into detail and and solve the equation. Uh, and so what are the well what's the the big idea here? Uh, how would you just given an equation like this, which you really know nothing about, how would you arrive at at a function that is a solution, assuming this initial condition? Uh, well, the idea is to use, use symmetries of the equation, which I'm going to tell you about, uh, to build a solution. Uh, so to build a general solution from a specific solution. And so how is this argument, argument gonna work? Well, what we're gonna do is we're going to find one very special function, which is an explicit function, which is gonna turn out to be some kind of Gaussian looking function, like e to the minus x squared with some other terms, including some t terms, uh, that solves the PDE. And then using this special function, which is called sometimes a source function or, or a Green's function or a fundamental solution, uh, we're going to use this to build all of all of the other solutions using the symmetries of of the equation, uh, and so we're going to get an integral formula involving this special function, which 
gives the general solution to the PDE. Uh, and so, well, for the, just for the, the final part of the lecture today, I'm just going to discuss what do I mean by, by symmetries. Uh, and so this is a common, uh, common process in studying partial differential equations where if you, you don't know how to solve them, you first look for, for different symmetries that are associated with your equation. And so these usually give you a starting point or give you ideas of, of how to proceed. Uh, right, so this is like what I want to. So let's just look, talk, talk briefly about the symmetries of the diffusion equation. And so what, is, what does symmetry mean, very loosely speaking? It means, well, a symmetry is a way of, of changing the solution, but still recovering another solution, right? right? So you do something, you do some, some action to the solution, and you end up with another solution. So this is what we'll mean by, by symmetries in, in the context of, of PDEs. Uh, and so what are, what are some, some initial examples of these? Uh, well, the first is related to translation, right? And so what do I mean by translation? And once I write this down, maybe it, it'll become a little clearer what, what we mean when we say symmetries. Uh, well, let's suppose that I have a solution U uh, is a solution. Again, whenever I talk about solutions in, in this lecture, it's gonna be to the diffusion equation, right? Well, then if I take u of x and I shift it by some point y uh, for any y, well, this is, is also a solution, right? And this is just an easy exercise, which you can, you can do. I mean, if I take two x derivatives, I technically have to use the chain rule, but when I use the chain rule, none of the derivatives, I mean, the y term just vanishes, right? So you get the same thing, right? And so this is relatively easy to, to check. If you don't believe me, just pause the lecture and just write out the calculation and it should be very, very straightforward to check that if I have a solution u and I translate u by, by some point y, then I get another solution. And so this is an example of, of what's called the translation symmetry, where my action is I shift the function, the input of the, of the x variable, and I still get another solution, right? which depends on the point y that I, that I chose. But the point is it's, it's another solution to the PDE, uh, not, the, not necessarily the initial value problem. We're just talking about, uh, about this equation. And we'll, we'll return to the IVP later. Uh, Right. Okay, and so that's the symmetry associated with translating. There's another symmetry associated with taking derivatives. And so, well, let's suppose u of xt is a solution. Well, if I take various derivatives of u, I'm going to get another solution, right? So let's say v is equal to uh, let's say ux or ut or like say uxt, uh, et cetera, right? Just take any, any mixed derivatives in x and t. Uh, well, it's gonna turn out that in any case, v is another solution. Right. And so what this says is that if I have a solution to the diffusion equation and I differentiate it either in the X or T variable any number of times, uh, you're gonna get another solution to the diffusion equation. And so what I'm gonna, well, let me prove why this is the case. Uh, I'm just gonna do the, the UX example and it should be clear how to proceed in, in general. Uh, so let's say V is equal to UX. Uh, well, what happens if I look at derivative with respect to t of v minus k times derivative with respect to x twice of v. Well, let's just plug in the definition for, for v. Well, this is derivative with respect to t of ux minus k times ux and then 2x partials. And so while well, this is equal to uxt minus k times u x x x, 
And so we'll note, remember that we have equality of mixed partials. And so also when while well, taking derivatives behave right commutes with with taking it with addition or distributes with addition. And so this is the same thing now as well taking derivative with respect to x of ut, right? Just switching the order of, of the partial derivatives, and then minus derivative with respect to x of uh, k times uxx, right? I just pulled out one of the x derivatives. But now I can take out this derivative again because of the addition rule for derivatives. Right? And so now this is equal to derivative with respect to x of, of now just the original diffusion operator. So this is d dx of zero, which is equal to zero. Right? And so again, this shows that if I let v equal the, the x partial derivative of u and u solves the diffusion equation, then I get another solution. Right. And so similar arguments will show that if you let V equal UT or V equals like UXT or, or and so on, you'll get other solutions to the diffusion equation. Right. And so this tells you in particular that if you have one solution to the diffusion equation, you can generate infinitely many more solutions by just taking derivatives. Right. So that's a, an interesting phenomenon. Uh, Okay, and so the, the next symmetry, which is common for all uh, linear partial differential equations, is what's called superposition. And so this is the property that any linear combination of solutions gives you another solution. Okay, and what, well, what do I mean by linear combination? Well, remember that uh, from, from linear algebra, right, so let's say I have vectors V1, V2, V3, up to V capital N are vectors, say in like the plane or something like that, and C1, C2, up to Cn are, are scalars or constants. Uh, what is a linear combination? Well, that's, you take a constant times V1 plus some other constant times V2 uh, and so on. Right, all the way up to whatever the N is. So you have some list of vectors and some list of scalars. You can combine them by adding multiples of the vectors. And so this is a, a, a linear combination. Right, and so well, this is you've you've certainly seen this previously if you've taken a, a linear algebra class. Uh, the same definition makes sense if you just replace the vectors by functions, and so it makes sense to talk about linear combinations of, of functions. And so, right, so let's suppose then, what do I mean by by linear combination of solutions? Let's suppose that I have say n different solutions to the diffusion equation. Right, so suppose these are all solutions to the diffusion equation. And suppose that C1, C2, and so on are all constants, meaning they don't depend on X and T. Uh, well, then I can construct another solution by taking a linear combination of the functions. Right, so v of x t equals c1 times u1 of x t plus c2 times u2 of x t, and so on, all the way up until the end. Uh, this is a solution as well. Right, and so this is just going to be, be as a consequence of the the linear linearity of the equation, right? And so the, the proof of this is just, I'm not gonna write out all the details. Maybe you should pause the lecture and check as, as another exercise to review what, what's going on. Uh, just the fusion equation is linear. Right, so if I apply the diffusion operator to V, well then it's gonna decompose as a sum of the diffusion operator applied to each of these terms. But if I apply it to each of these terms by linearity, it's going to be zero since each of these terms is a solution. 
And so therefore the sum of all the zeros is zero. So, so V is also a solution. Okay, and so there's there's just two more two more symmetries, and then we'll be we'll be done for the day. Uh, and so the next one actually turns out to be sort of very deeply connected to the superposition principle. Uh, and so this is like the basically the limiting form of the superposition principle. And so this says the following. Well, let's let's go back to this equation I have for V. And let's say I instead, uh, let's write it in summation notation, say sum from I equals one to N. I had some constant CI uh, times UI of XT. Let's say I let CI equal some value of some function G, say at a point uh, uh, XI. And let's say, well, using the, the oh, sorry, using the translation, let's say I shift this. Using the property A, right? And let's say I let my CI be some function G evaluated at some point Y. And maybe that point depends on i, so maybe this is u i of, of x minus y i, right? And so if I plug this in, well, since g is just evaluated at a fixed point, it still acts as a constant, right? Because it doesn't depend on x or t. And so this is a, another solution, right? So this is just some kind of fancy version of, of just the, the linear combination from before also using the translation property, which was symmetry A, it's where we're allowed to shift the functions around if we want to and still get solutions. Uh, but now if I divide this by one over N, right, if you scale a solution, you get another solution because it's linear. And so now looking at this, this should remind you of a Riemann sum, right? And so if I let N converge to infinity, I'm gonna get an integral of this function G Right, well, let's suppose that the points y i are, are are separated by one over n, right? So it's like y one, y two, and so on, separated by one over n. Then this is a Riemann sum, and so when I take the limit, it will converge to to an integral, say from minus infinity to infinity of g. Uh, let's suppose now that it's just one function u, and the difference is just comes from shifting. And so then we're going to get u of x minus y times t uh, dy, right? And so the point is if I cleverly use the superposition principle along with the translation property and then take a limit, I'm going to get this integral. And so then you would expect that this integral should be another solution, which turns out to be the case. And so what is property d? Uh, so this is, I guess, a, like a theorem if u is a solution to the diffusion equation, then uh, for, for any, I'm gonna put any in quotes, uh, function g, if I take this integral, I get another solution. Integrating with respect to y. Uh, and so why did I put any in quotes? Well, you need to make sure that this integral exists, right? So this is true as, as long as, as the integral is finite. Right, and, and there are some other technical issues related to, to this fact, which we're gonna just sweep under the rug and ignore. But for all, for all purposes for our class, uh, as long as the function is relatively nicely behaved, this formula will make sense, so. Right. And so this is another way of saying that if I find one specific solution, say some, say some function u, then I can construct infinitely many other solutions by just integrating that against some other function g. Right. And so this is what we're going to do later on. Uh, 
right? Okay, and so, right, what's the, again, the motivation for this was just the, using the superposition principle before. Uh, if this little bit I did with the UI was confusing before, well, you can define your function UI of XT to be some fixed function U minus YI at T, and that's that's what I meant to do, and I just I just wrote the wrong thing initially. Uh, right, but we're really just using the, the superposition principle here in a, in a slightly clever way to take the limit and, and get an integral. Uh, okay, and then the final symmetry is a little bit simpler than that, so it's just related to scaling. Right, and it's the following. So suppose U of X T is a solution to the diffusion equation. Uh, well, then for any real number, say A, right, so any real number A, uh, you can construct another solution by taking U of square root of AX times, or square, U applied to square root of A times X, comma A times T. Uh, so this is another solution. Right, so maybe I, I can call this like VA of X comma T. Uh, and so for the proof of this, you just, just differentiate and check. I'm not gonna write that out here, uh, but it may be a good idea now that the lecture is ending to just quickly check this for yourself and, and see that this is indeed a, another solution. Uh, and so this gives you a, a yet another way to build new solutions from an old solution because I have some, maybe I have some function U which solves the, the PDE. If I scale u in this way, I get another function. A can be any number, right? I can let a go to a can be like 10, 10 million or something like that. It gives me another solution, right? Uh, okay, and so that's that's it for today. And so on Thursday, we're going to use all these these symmetries that are listed out here. We're going to combine them all, and we're going to arrive at at the solution formula. Uh, and then we'll discuss a little bit about some, some implications of the, of the formula. Uh, all right.